Thank you very much uh, to all the attendees of this talk and, of course, Eduardo Castelló, our speaker for today. I'm going to present our speaker, Eduardo Castelló. Research interests are related to robotics, blockchain technology and complex systems. He was a Marie Curie Fellow at the MIT Media Lab, where he worked on the combination of distributed robotic systems and blockchain technology. His work focuses on implementing new security behavior and business models for distributed robotics by using novel cryptographic methods. Eduardo received his Bachelor of Science in Intelligent Systems from the University of Portsmouth in UK, and his Master and PhD in Robotics Engineering from Osaka University in Japan. Part of his research has been focused on swarm robotics and how to achieve cooperative and self-sustaining groups of robots. And today, Eduardo will talk about the possibilities and limitations of combining state-of-the-art robotic systems with blockchain technology. So again, Eduardo, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure like to be here um, and you know, like talk to you like about like this uh, new research field that like we created like in the past like three years. So um, as as you were saying, what we are going to talk about is what happens when you combine two things that apparently don't do much with each other, but together they do something new, right? Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about robotics and blockchain technology, and we coin this combination as like a trustable autonomy, right? Uh, but this is an umbrella concept that uh, in, involves like many, many, many things that we will like uh, disclose like during this presentation, right? So yeah, this was like a project that uh, was like the collaboration between a European university and an American university. In this case, it was MIT, which is like my the, the university I work for, and the Univer University of Free like Brussels, which is like the, the university that like I conducted like some of the experiments that I'm going to explain here. So without for you, let's let's start the presentation. And normally, I I like to introduce um, this uh, research a little bit with with some history, right? Um, <clears throat> so in this slide, what you can see is uh, my PhD advisor and his robot clone, right? So um, maybe as as Pablo has like said, like I. Um, did my master's and my PhD like in robotics engineering in Japan. And there for, for eight years, <clears throat> I had one of these two guys as, a, as an advisor. So um, my, my advisor called Professor Ishiguro was very interested in doing something that maybe we all tried like to do at some point in time in our lives, which was basically trying like to be in two places at the same time. Right, so somehow Professor Ishiguro was like a very famous like professor in Japan, and like um, he was based in Osaka, but like he was giving lectures in Tokyo, in Kyoto, in Kobe, and he realized that in order like to be there, right, like he needed like to travel there, he needed like to transport his atoms, you know, his body, right, like to a place where actually, yeah, he he didn't want to be, he he just wanted like to transfer his presence like there, right. So um, somehow the the solution like to this problem that we all faced was creating like a robot that looked like him, that talked like him, and somehow could represent him in these like uh, places, right? So maybe like you, you will be able to see better, you know, with this video. So in this video, the, the professor and the robot are in the same place, which is not normally like the purpose of this research, but uh, you see how like uh, one is controlling the other. So Professor Ishiguro is at the left, uh, um, like the robot is at, is at the right, right? So normally how this works is that uh, every time Professor Ishiguro wants like, to use the robot, um, he is in his desktop, right? And there's, there's an array of cameras which are detecting all the movements, like uh, not only from the upper torso, but like from the, uh, from the face, right? And these uh, small displacements of muscles are transferred like uh, to the robot. Right, so the robot is doing exactly what like a uh, professor Ishiguro is, is doing. You, you should think about kind of like a very expensive Skype client, right? Yeah, but the the, the thing is that uh, the, the funny thing is that yeah, of course, professor Ishiguro uh, didn't want to be in that like a PhD defense in Tokyo while he was in Osaka or in 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 that like art exposition in in Copenhagen. But somebody had to take the robot, you know, where Professor Ishiguro didn't want to be. And actually, that was me, right? Like, so for two years, uh, yeah, I, I think two years, 
I took the robot as my luggage, and then I traveled all the world, you know, like uh, putting the robot where Professor Ishiguro didn't want to be. So all the um, security guards of the um, Northern Hemisphere, right, knows my face because for two years I was traveling with a human torso in my luggage. Anyway, so besides like this uh, crazy like story, um, somehow the the idea of the future of robotics that Professor Ishiguro had was uh, to have like a one very complex, very expensive robot that could represent you, right? That could do something for you, right? So this was like a little bit like his idea, right, of the future of robotics. And while I started my PhD like there, I realized that my idea of the future of robotics was a little bit different. So instead of having one very expensive, very hard to repair like robot that could represent you, very complex, my idea was a little bit more like this. So. What you're seeing uh, here, I hope, is um, is something we call a swarm of robots, right? Uh, so a swarm of robots is basically like a system in which uh, uh, many very simple, like a, but in big numbers, like a robotic system, uh, coordinate and cooperate in order like, to do something uh, very complex, right? So it's, I think it's a pity that you cannot see this. I really don't know why. Ah, now, okay, fantastic. So what you're seeing here is like a, these like robots, which are very, very simple. Somehow they resemble like ants, right? And what they are doing is something called foraging, right? So foraging is, the, is, the, is, a, is a process that like animals and human beings like uh, do, which is somehow exploring uh, an environment, looking like for resources, in this case, like food, right? So, so robots, what they are doing here is that um, they are exploring this like football field in order like to find these like three D printed tokens that you see around, right? These three these three D printed tokens could represent I don't know like uh, from resources like um, like energy or or like some ob desired objects that you want to retrieve to like passengers in a city like to data like to whatever like you want, right? So the interesting thing about this um, system is that robots do not have like a centralized control, right? There's no single robot boss that is telling the other robots what to do. They are some, somehow self-organizing, right? So robots decide based on, on, on their own like idea of how the system is, if they want to go out, like looking like for these like 3D printed tokens, which are resources, but once they find this like a 3D printed token, they can put it into the center of the, um, of the football field. And this center of the football field resembles like a human society, resembles a system that rewards them like for doing an action, right? So, so this system, in this case, uh, what it does is that, okay, robot 59, you gave me like this like, token, I will recharge your batteries, right? So you can keep on like doing whatever like you are doing. So what we did in this like system is, uh, if you have like a self-organizing system, but also you have like a third party entity that is, uh, interacting with this system, you have like a way in which this, this kind of like robotic system without any centralized controller or whatever can self-sustain very long periods of time, right? And this is good when you don't want to monitor this system, when you don't need like a human being like present, like in order like to check that the robotic system is doing whatever it's supposed like to do, right? Or for example, you want the system like to uh, be tolerant to failure, right? Like, so in this case, if one robot like fails or two robots like fails, the other can cope without actually any human uh, intervening into the system, right? So it's a very robust, a very fault tolerant like system. Very, very different from the idea that Professor Ishii will have, right? So, but when, when I finished my PhD, I realized that this uh, feel of like a distributed robotic systems or it's, it's uh, extreme uh, called swarm robotic systems, right? Like because robots are kind of like belong to a swarm, like bees, like ants, like these like social insects, um, is very polarized, yeah? It's very polarized, like many things in this society, right? And not only politics are polarized like these days, right? Also research fields, which was like an interesting like thing that I, I found. So this, this world of, uh, this field of like ro swarm robotics was very polarized because I found two communities, right? There was a community A, which was like people that said, okay, I want to do fundamental research, on the properties of this system, and I don't, I want to do theory, and I want to um, research 
like social insects and I want to understand what it works like there and put it into robots, but I don't have any uh, interest in uh, transferring like this like knowledge into society or into uh, into real deployments, right? So there's this community A and they are very, very, they're very niche, they're very closed, right? But also there's community B and community B is the, is the people that believes that this technology is going to be, is going to radically change like the, the world of logistics, of transportation, of mobility, right? In the next five to 10 years, right? Is the people that, you know, that talks about uh, Amazon delivering packages, you know, like uh, with drones or uh, swarms of self-driving cars, like in cities, like moving people from one place to another, right? And, and there's a couple of companies that started like to do this kind of like thing. But the interesting thing is that this, this uh, community B, right, uh, sees the, the use of this technology in society, but doesn't understand, you know, like the problems, you know, of deploying such systems into, in, into, re into the real world, right? So for example, you know, this, this community doesn't understand that we have no security standards, for example, like for these systems. What happens if, uh, okay, one robot fails, the others can cope, but what happens if one robot is hacked and starts like, to share uh, information that is, is, uh, is misleading to the other like robots? Will the system prevail the same? Uh, so there's no, we really do not understand how, how to get consensus like in these big systems, right? How do we agree that uh, now the swarm has to do one thing, but at some point in time, you know, has to do some other thing, right? There's no real behavior differentiation. Like, so, so there's no uh, use of how to make the swarm do two things at the same time, right? Uh, so ants do one thing and bees do one thing, but robots, you know, can do several things, right? Like, so how do we add heterogeneity like into these systems? Is, is, is this possible? Uh, because I guess that maybe like the the, the robot that can deliver uh, packages in Amazon can also transport people in, in theory, right? But how, how do we how do we add you know this heterogeneity like into these systems? And the most important thing is that there is no real business models, right? There's like some understanding that these systems you know are are very interesting like to uh, to society, but we don't understand how to capitalize like these systems. So. Again, the, in a nutshell, what I realize is that this field is very polarized. There's one community like talking about their things, right? And, and their theories and, and, and their research. There's other community talking about the potential use cases you know, like for, for society, but these communities do not talk to each other. There's no bridge, there's no interface between these two communities, right? So I decided like to place myself in the middle and develop technology to make these two communities talk to each other, right? So what I'm going to present in the next uh, slides is a little bit what, what is our research with the first bubble, you know, with security, for example, right? Which is like a major like topic that we all should care, you know, like about, you know, when, when we deploy robots like to the real world, right? Um, uh, but before that, let me uh, try like to introduce you like about why do we have these kind of like problems, you know, like uh, in this in this field of like distributed robotic systems, multi-agent systems, strong robotics, etc. The problem that we have here is that uh, the world of robotics uh, paid a significant a significant effort in the last thirty years in uh, to develop like a new field called human robot interaction, right? So, which is how like robots and humans can interact with each other and how do we, uh, so what happens in this combination, right? Um, do we trust like uh, robots? Robots can do something like to engage us like more into, into this interaction. And, but this field was just uh, designed in order to have one robot in the equation. One robot, maybe with several humans or with one human, but one robot, right? So you can see a lot of like research about like Alexa, like about like, for example, um, Neo robot. So how, 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 for example, do we do empathy, you know, with these robots, etc. But it's always one robot. The problem is that this field of strong robotics uh, leverages its power, not because we have one robot, but, beho but because we have many robots, we have redundancy, right? And redundancy is very cool, you know, for example, to, to achieve a robust system, so full tolerance, a little bit, you know, what I described like in the, in the previous uh, slides, but also redundancy comes at a cost. That is that sometimes we don't really understand uh, what is going on in this network or like of robots, especially when there's different robots that they share data, et cetera, right? So for example, 
an operator that is uh, has to do has to deal with 10 20 30 robots imagine uh, has a problem because at some point in time if you have one robot you pay all your attention to that robot and you might understand you know what the robot is trying like to do or not when you have five robots right somehow you have to dedicate 20 percent of your attention to each robot in order to understand the robots are do still doing what they're supposed like to do but when you have 100 robots it's almost impossible you know like your your attention right uh, so your cognitive abilities to understand the system or to pay attention to the system just are just gone right uh, the cognitive level was surpassed right and one of the things that uh, i realized why mm, we have a lot of problems you know like with these distributed robotic systems is because we lack interfaces the, all the research and all the uh, interfaces that like, we develop like for one human one robot do not apply when we have one human many robots normally we will need like something that uh, will be able like to make the system scale from 10 to 100 to 1000 to 1 million even robots but at the same time do not surpass our cognitive abilities to understand the system right a little bit like the green line that i'm showing here so one of the key things you know like for this uh, for the for to achieve this uh, green line is trust right and trust is is like a word that um, is very big right but uh, trust uh, maybe could be defined by the ability uh, to believe in somebody that might uh, issue like a different behavior that you expect, but still, you know, you, you have confidence in that like peer, right? Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the big breakthroughs that we had in the last um, 15 years in computer science was the fact that before these 15 years, we didn't have digital tools to understand trust, right? For example, the, the internet, right, which is like the, the main tool that like changed everything or revolutionized everything in its infancy or in, in its origin was not created like to generate trust, right? Was created like to uh, move information efficiently from point A to point B or give voice like to the communities that actually didn't have a voice like in the real world or, or give like an expression method, you know, like to these people. So you could be whoever you wanted like to be, right? But not to give trust. That's why actually we, we have a lot of problems these days now, you know, like with the technology, because like it was not designed like for that, right? But uh, 15 years ago, there was like a breakthrough, like about like uh, in the digital world, that is something called the blockchain, the blockchain, right? And I will explain you why I say the blockchain, right? Because uh, the blockchain as deep learning as uh, AI, as uh, data science, as many of the terms, big terms that you know, right, has been used and abused and has, and basically means everything and nothing at the same time, right? So I, just a disclaimer, I do not think that the blockchain is the solution to every problem in, the, in, in mankind. I do not think that actually is, um, is something that is meant like for every single thing, you know, that like we could imagine. I, I don't endorse uh, stuff like, for example, you know, we have seen crazy things like uh, coins, uh, crypto cryptocurrency for plumbers or these kind of things. So uh, somehow, you know, this has to like to do with uh, the hype cycles, right, of technology and how people, you know, use these hype cycles, right? But one of the interesting things about the blockchain, like for me, is not only like the speculation on the cryptocurrencies, like and the crazy projects, but uh, the, the blockchain is kind of like an umbrella concept, like for many different techniques, the, the many different like methods, right? That are little gems, right? That applied to other problems that we have in other fields, you know, could be very useful, you know, beyond Bitcoin, beyond the cryptocurrency, beyond like the 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 the, the hype, right? So, for example, one of the concepts that I I fell in love with when I discovered this was the idea that somehow in the digital world, right? in the physical and the digital world trust was managed in a centralized way right so for example uh, up to 15 years ago if uh, alice wanted like to send one bitcoin like to like a uh, bob or one dollar or one euro right somehow there was a central entity that did as middleman in order to say okay no worries uh, 
um, I will guarantee I will be the guarantor that this um, piece of like value that like Alice is trying like to give to all is is legal. And Bob, don't worry, you know, like you can give now a service or a product like to Alice because this is is okay, right? Actually, this worked like pretty fine, right? But the problem is that when you have like centralized points of like power of of information of 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 trust, normally these centralized like, points of 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 this uh, of this accumulation of, of of these things normally end up like in a very bad way. One because they are like one point of attack. Everybody that wants to attack the system knows where to attack, and when this fails, actually everything fails because the middleman like a, like falls, right? But also normally they get corrupt because in the moment that you put together like a lot of like uh, information, a lot of power, a lot of like uh, influence, normally. These things like tend like to not work in in, in positive like ways, right? Um, many people in data science like, will will know like uh, like about how these, for example, B corps uh, got like data that really define us, and and how this low accountability of these data and these big volumes of these data somehow are not the the thing that we are looking for in the future, right? But um, but well, the the discovery of the breakthrough of the of the blockchain was that. Now, instead of like having like a centralized point of trust, we could have a decentralized uh, configuration of this trust, right? A decentralized setup. So, which means that instead of having like a, a bank, like a government, like as, as a middleman, if we have a network of people, uh, each one in a different place, each one with different incentives, whatever, uh, and they all agree that Alice gave one euro like to Bob, right? And they are not supposed to be like in any kind of like a lobby like together. Maybe this network of people of very different people in their, in very different places in very different circumstances, if they all agree, somehow maybe that actually happened, right? And, and this is the big big breakthrough of the blockchain, like passing that from a centralized point of trust to a decentralized point of trust. So basically, these transactions that I just explained, like uh, what happens is that like they get into into blocks, right? And then when the block is like full, yeah, uh, somehow like somebody stamps like this block, right? Kind of like verifying that this information is fine. So once like a block is stamped, right, uh, is um, blocks get attached like to to this block, right? And somehow like mm, blocks that come after in the blockchain reference blocks that were before in the blockchain. So now changing information that is already in the blockchain is very hard because you have to change a lot of information that actually is like linked together, right? So in a sense, what you, what the, the, the accountability that the blockchain gives, right? Or the transparency that the blockchain gives is that if something is in the blockchain and is public, it's very hard to censor. It's very hard like, to take it back, right? Which is a very interesting thing, you know, when we, Think about like data sharing, or we think like about uh, doing some notifications or testifications of things that actually happen, right? Somehow, the blockchain, right, or this this system that I explain in very um, uh, easy terms, let's say like that, is what happens when you have like a history book of a network of people, right? And the research that I'm going like to explain you uh, now is what happens when this history book is not only like about people, but it's about robots. So what happens, what can you do when this history book of these transactions uh, are uh, not only like a network of like uh, users, but a network of robots, which could be AIs, could, could be like um, not only, so for me, a robot is basically a, a computer that has the physical ability to interact with the world, right? But it could be any other like kind of like a agent, right? So, and, and then you will tell me about, okay, but all this, why, uh, Edu? Um, and then I will say, well, you know, this is very useful, yeah, in order like to write like a trade-off that we are all kind of like uh, facing these days, right? Which is the idea of security versus utility. So in the digital world, and especially in the data world, you know, we are all somehow battling like this like trade-off. Somehow, uh, the right data in the right hands is super powerful. Right. For example, if uh, I don't know, like all medical records of like patients with cancer, you know, will will be in the hands like of like um, physicians and like a uh, data scientist, you know, uh, will be dramatically uh, positive, you know, like for like a, a like a breakthrough, like in in detection in AI and whatever. But so 
what will happen if that uh, information will go like to to the insurance companies, right? So things could go very wrong, right? So we need to maximize the utility of the data that like we we have, right? Or what the system generates, or what the society generates. But at the same time, we need it secure so we don't misuse it, right? Let me give you an example. So the guy that you see here, like in this like uh, slide, is a guy called uh, uh, James, right? James is a is a little like, fellow that I had the opportunity like to meet in 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 MIT in Boston, and is a fellow with uh, autism, right? Uh, so I don't know if you know, but like kids with autism, like normally go like to therapy like in some hospitals, especially when they are very young, and 10 or 15 years ago, we discovered that robots are fantastic tools, you know, like to interact like with these uh, autistic kids, especially because so autistic kids really like robots, right? Because uh, they know more or less that they are predictable, right? But robots could be programmed in order like to, for example, tell stories like to these autistic kids, showing them what, what, what emotions mean, for example, you know, like autistic kids have like problems like uh, having empathy with emotions such as like a joy or, or uh, anger or these kind of like things. So what we did is that we program like a robot to tell a story like to the to the kid, right? Saying, well, so in this story, there's this character that, you know, went around and then uh, he fell in the rain and he's sad. And then the robot like somehow did like a, uh, like a movement, like a sad movement. So the kid knows that, ah, okay, so, so being sad is, is being like that. Okay, I understand, right? Um, this was like a fantastic like research, uh, uh, very, 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 very um, famous and, and, and very successful. But we discovered uh, certain like things that like uh, we could improve. For example, you know, the data management, right? For example, an autistic kid in the United States is a little bit what you're seeing here. So there's data like about this kid, like uh, that doctors collect and put it into their database, right? There's data about these autistic kids that educators collect and then they put it into their databases. And then there's um, data that about these autistic kids that public institutions have and they put it into their databases. By law, at least in the United States, this data, and I think Europe is more or less the same, um, these databases cannot talk to each other because you cannot cross-reference like this like information, right? Uh, but what we discovered is that this information will be super useful, you know, like for us that we were designing the robot like controllers to understand uh, how to improve the storytelling like to that particular kid, right? So, but we realized that we couldn't access like to the whole set of information. So we discovered that, uh, okay, we couldn't access like to the information as a whole, but we could ask questions to the information. We could throw queries. Right? So basically it was, okay, uh, can I ask you a question about the, infor about the information you have? Don't, don't share with me the raw information. I don't want it. I don't want to see it. But can you give me an aggregated answer like about this? And with this information, I could train my uh, AI models into, into something. So actually we discovered that this was like possible, right? And, and we created like a system in which Robots uh, were uh, uh, conducting like the, the therapy, were conducting the storyteller, the storytelling with the kids, right? And at the same time, every time that they were throwing like a question or they were like throwing an algorithm like to the data instead of like the data to the algorithm. So we send an algorithm to the data instead of like getting data to the algorithm, right? So every time that the robot was asking a, asking a question or was sharing like the the the, the model that like uh, we were computing like uh, like some some metrics this information was registered in the blockchain, right? So the robot had to identify itself, like in the blockchain, say, I am robot 59, and I am conducting this therapy, and I, I am asking this question, and I am getting this answer, okay? Of course, you know, like this information was aggregated data, so you couldn't really see, you know, which particular kid, you know, was in the data, right? But the information was public. So in a sense, the interesting thing is that after the training of the machine learning models and everything, if the legal guardian of the kid wanted like to know what information does the robot have about his or her kid, he could basically go to the blockchain and with like the private key, right? Like uh, or his own private key as legal guardian, 
he could know exactly what the robot know and what kind of information the robot use in order like to train its machine learning model or uh, or basically conduct this therapy with the kid, which is the first time that you can audit a robot, right? Um, well, so what we did besides that is we're saying, okay, so it would be super interesting the fact that we have many robots in different hospitals and there's some hospitals, you know, that are in very populated areas and some other hospitals that are not in so populated areas. Like, so maybe it would be fantastic that the robots that like uh, conduct therapies with kids in Kentucky or Iowa uh, will be able like, to also see or benefit like from, the, from what we learn in Boston or in San Francisco, which are more populated areas. So we, we created this uh, federated like uh, learning like approach in which uh, we uh, send the model around, right? Instead of the data around. So the data stays local, never moves, you know, like the, the local site, the hospital in that case. And what we do is just like we move the model around. So at some point in time, the model sees all the data without actually moving the data, right? So this is like a, a, a paper called Robot Chain, which I, I recommend you like to, to read it. It's very, very interesting. Um, and, you know, the information like about the clinical trials is still on processing because it takes like really long time to, to disclose this information, but it's, it's like something that you, if you, if you look, uh, you will be able to, like to find all the information about this project. Okay. But there's a problem with this approach. The problem is that, okay, you tell me, oh, it's fantastic. Like uh, the, ro the robots, uh, you know, learn without moving the data. Uh, fantastic. There's a network of robots that they learn from each other. It's fantastic. But uh, this works in case everybody tells the truth, right? So in case there's no robot that uh, is, is um, has like a, a problem, has like a sensor error, um, has like problems you know, with their computation, uh, is, is, throws misinformation, et cetera, right? And this is very curious because like we are starting like to see how these networks of robots uh, that talk to each other are starting like to be seen as kind of like infrastructure, especially for example, for cities, right? So we are thinking like about what happens, you know, when your smart car talks to your it talks to the road and the road like talks like to the city hall and and all these kind of like things right or when your car will talk to your smart agenda that talks like to your alexa that talks to your home like about when to switch on like the heating like for in the moment that you arrive and don't like uh, waste uh, resources etc right but when this becomes infrastructure right there's like some incentive you know like to get information you know like uh, uh, from it or like to hijack or 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 to prevent this like from functioning in order like to get like some economical or strategical like um like ready you know out of this right so for example this research like from not so long time ago talks about the idea of how easy is to compromise a self-driving car right so we think that these cars you know are going to be um are going to move us around and whatever but uh, the technology is going very fast and the companies are taking that kind of like a rush to market like a like approach because they want to be the first ones like to deliver this kind of like a test and like a technology in cities and whatever but they are not covering their security holes there there's that they are leaving behind right for example but but the idea is that uh, maybe okay let me explain it in this way do you remember maybe four five or six years ago that there was this um polemic huge polemic about this ransomware that at some point in time you open up your computer and then you saw like a pop-up and the pop-up like said, your hard drive is being encrypted. Uh, uh, all your files are going to be destroyed. If you don't like um, send, I don't know, $1,000 in Bitcoin like to this address, right? I remember that. So that, that was cute, you know? But imagine that you are in your self-driving car, right? Uh, going 120 kilometers per hour like in the highway, right? And then there's like a pop-up that comes like from your dashboard saying, your self-driving car has been compromised. If you don't send $1,000 in Bitcoin, I won't break. Things, things get different, right? And especially because we don't have the idea that uh, when, when things go wrong in the digital realm with computers, the casualties could be data theft, data uh, lost, uh, economical, yes, uh, economical um, problems, yes, okay. But when we uh, transfer 
these two robots, which again are computers with the physical ability to interact with the world, when the things go wrong, also imply physical consequences, right? So imagine. So for example, in this research, they, they were talking like about the idea of, okay, so let, we have like a fleet of self-driving cars in New York and they are all moving people from one place to another. And I, since this became like public infrastructure, now I want to have an attack and I want to like block Manhattan, for example, right? What will take me like to block Manhattan? Well, it takes, so it, 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 we found out that uh, if you uh, know how these self-driving cars are moving in, in New York and you know which self-driving car is uh, going through Times Square or through a bridge or through a narrow alley that is very busy or whatever, you can just block it Right, you can just lock it and then make make like a huge traffic jam and even block like a city, which actually has significant consequences, you know, like for, for, a, for a country. And it's not very complicated like to do, right? In theory. Uh, so what we did was, okay, we see this, we see that there's huge security holes like in these systems. Can we do something? And, and the answer is yes, right? The answer is that many of the problems of this like security in these distributed robotic systems comes from the idea that uh, we are in a packet-based communication system. So robots are computers that, has, that have wheels, that have arms, and then they communicate through each other through uh, packet-based communication such as UDP, TCP, IP, etc. right? But uh, things start like, to change when you pass like, from a communication system based on packet-based communication to a system based on transaction-based communication. Things start like to change because the transactions that you make, right, uh, give you new ways of like playing this game, right? For example, um, gives you the idea that the transactions are registered. So at some point in time, you said something that could be compared like in the future, right? And based on how accurate this information was, right, your reputation as a robot or as a peer or as an engine could change, right? Let, let me explain, right? So for example, what you see here in this slide is like a, a very, very simple like problem, which is uh, 30 robots, very similar to the ones we saw at the beginning of the presentation, <clears throat> doing something, collect, something called collective sensing. So what they do is that they go around, again, there's no boss, there's no central uh, <clears throat> point of authority, sorry. <clears throat> So the robots, what they do, what they are trying like, to do is that they are trying to, <coughs> sorry. Um, what they are trying to do is they're trying to reach a consensus. They're trying to say, okay, we want to know if in this checkerboard that we have as a floor, there's more white or there's more black, right? So uh, what they do is that they go around, they, they have a sensor like in the, in the base and then they, send, they sense the tiles and they say, well, in the last 10 minutes, I sense 80% black tiles and 20% white tiles. So I think the majority color is white, right? And then when they bump into each other, they share their opinions. So at some point in time, sub-consensus between robots emerge into big consensus, right? As, as, okay, the whole swarm or the whole team believes that white is the majority color, black is the majority color, right? Very, very simple. So what we did was put in these robots and then change like the, the difficulty value, which is the number of black tiles versus the number of white tiles, is not the same. And that the robots reach a consensus about 90% black over 10% white, that 51% black, 49% white, right? So this is what we did. And then we compare um, state of the art consensus algorithms in distributed systems, stuff that Google is using, Facebook is using, etc., to a blockchain, okay? And we said, let's see what happens, right? If in, instead of like sending each other uh, their, their votes or, or their packet-based like uh, information, we put a blockchain in the middle. Okay, so what we see here is basically in the first uh, graph is the, classic, is the classical approach, right? And the second set of graphs is the blockchain approach, right? So the colors are different algorithms, right? And what you see like in the x-axis is the difficulty of the, of the environment. So 0.52, 0.56. So this is, as, as you progress, the x-axis is more and more difficult, right? And the y-axis is the success rate. 
how many times the system um, succeeded in the right, like uh, in the right column, right? So what you see is that there's not much difference, right, between the classical approach, right, or the classical approaches with the blockchain approach, right? Actually, the blockchain approach normally takes more time, right, because you need like to do some cryptography like in the middle, etc., right, and it doesn't give you, especially for example, like here. Right or here doesn't give you the success rate that the classical approaches give you, right? So seeing this graph, we will have no real merit of adding like a blockchain, which gives you a lot of overhead, right? For something that is, is not mm, uh, performing like so well, it's not so efficient, right? Well, what we did now is we got like some of these robots and we hacked them deliberately. So we simulated a robot that had like a broken motor, so was only seeing the same tile or had like some sensor errors or lost the communication or a robots that basically uh, were hacked to mislead the other robots, like to say the opposite, right? And break consensus. And we call these robots Byzantine robots, right? Bad, bad bots, yeah? So, and then we paired again, like the two approaches. And basically the idea of this is that, uh, so we got like uh, the robots into the system, the robots, uh, we got like a smart contract, which actually is somehow a way, it's a constitution of the robots, it's a way in which the robots communicate among themselves, how do they add votes, how do they see who voted to who and, and to which color, etc. right? And uh, we put them again, again like into, into, into the research, right? So what we discovered this time is that, for example, again, the first graph is the classical approaches and the second graph is the uh, blockchain approaches, right? So now the x-axis, instead of being the difficulty, is the number of bad bots that we included into the, into the mix, right? So what you can see is that for a swarm of 30 members, right, if you add three bad bots, so it's a like 10% of the swarm, the success rate drops by 90%. And again, the, the idea is that, and we go back to the, to the beginning of the presentation, is that these systems, because they have redundancy, can cope with certain like problems such as like poll tolerance, such as a uh, robustness. You know, in case of like a, a in case of one robot like fails, etc. Right? But redundance comes also at a cost. That is, that misinformation is really hard to remove from the system, and could great uh, could generate a huge impact. Right? For example, in a packet based uh, method is very hard like that I say okay I am robot one and I go to robot two and I say hey I think black is the majority color and then immediately I go to robot three and I said no white is the majority color right so in this um, kind of like interaction it will be very difficult to spot me unless actually you two meet right in that, in that moment, you will not be able like, to find that I got into an inconsistency. But let's go like, to the blockchain like approach. What we can see is that even though we create a lot of like um, bad bots and we put into the system, the success rate somehow uh, gets moderately like stable, right? And this is because in the blockchain approach, robots have to transact with each other, right? So what happens is that if I told robot one that Mm, this is a uh, white is the majority color. I told robot three that uh, black is the majority color. At some point in time, uh, either through me or either through other people, through other robots, the blockchain will try to try to 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 consensuate in a in a uh, or will try to converge, right? And at some point in time, you will be able like, to see that I got into an inconsistency. That in a very short amount of time, in in with uh, in in a very weird way because we all share the same controller, I contradicted myself, and if you do that, right, you can assign a reputation to that robot. You say maybe this robot is not so trustworthy. Maybe there's a problem with it, and if the reputation drops under a certain threshold, you can actually weed out that robot from the system, and you and you don't trust it anymore. Another interesting thing that you can do with this is that you can now make robots vouch for their opinion so if they if they have some amount of like tokens right they can say i did my work pretty well so i i think that the majority color is black right so 
I am I am so confident in this in the, in the fact that I did my work well or this information is trustworthy that I'm willing to deposit one token in order to vouch for for that opinion. And if at some point in time the other like robots or the swarm reaches like a consensus on the opposite color, right, or reaches like or gets into the conclusion that I was misleading the, the swarm, I lose my my money. And if I don't have money, maybe I cannot talk, right? So this is the first time that we got together the idea of um, creating an incentive mechanism in which lying costs you money, right? In this kind of like system, of course. We are not talking about euros or, or dollars, but what? anyway, if you are interested like in this idea, I recommend you like a paper that we just like published in the Transaction Robotics, very good journal called Following Leaders in Byzantine Multi-Robot Systems, right? And this is like a little bit how to do this uh, idea when robots have to be leaders and have to lead like uh, uh, other robots or other agents in, in a path, right? And how you can start to trust leaders that, that get, get the reputation or have the reputation and how you weed out leaders that uh, will mislead you or are misleading like the system and how to basically contain, you know, like this, this uh, misinformation and these lies into a sequential action, which is like going from point A to point B in, in a kind of like labyrinth, right? But uh, I will finish uh, this presentation you know, with this work. This is the last work that we published. We published it in science, in science robotics. Uh, this was uh, a lot of work like to do and somehow like adds kind of like a, a twist like to all this research, right? So it's called Secure and Secure Cooperation in Robotic Swarms. And let me let me explain to you about how this, this goes. So, okay. So far, we came to the conclusion that if, uh, okay, you, you can have like a distributed robotic system, this distributed robotic system can do something, right? Uh, there's, there's agents, you know, that like might be uh, misleading, like the or could spread like a wrong information because of whatever reason. Uh, but one of the other costs of redundancy, which actually has its benefits, is the fact that in order to make robots cope, in order to make robots uh, uh, take the job of another robot that somehow failed, so the system doesn't doesn't lose its performance, is the fact that all the robots know what is the plan, what is the thing to do. Okay, so in a sense. You, as a controller, you, as an operator, need to give the plan, the full detailed plan to the robots. So the robots say, hey, robot 15 uh, has an error or has a mistake. I will take over, right? Because I know what to do, right? And actually, this is a problem because if there's a guy or there's like a third party that actually wants to know what the robot system is doing and how to alter its behavior because you know what is going like to happen like uh, with the robot system, the only thing you have to do is take one robot, uh, see the, the controller, right? Do some kind of like reverse engineering like in the robot, see the controller, and then immediately you will know what the, all the other robots are doing, right? Or what are they going to do, right? So uh, this is very complicated in situations in which you have systems deployed in the real world, right? So we, we thought, is there the possibility in using these tools, these like blockchain like tool set, that robots do things that belong to a plan, a complicated plan, without actually knowing what the plan is about. So anybody that could get this robot and reverse engineer the robot, like I say, okay, what, what are you doing? What's, what, what's, what's the plan? What's the higher le level objective, right? The robot says, I don't know. I was just doing this and I know this is part of the plan, but nothing else. So cannot deliver any information. So you cannot use it in order to attack the system like in the future. Well, it turns out, yes, you can do it. And you can do it because of like a, a technique, because of a method that is called a Merkle tree, right? A Merkle tree is like a fundamental technology within the blockchain space that uh, what it does is that encrypts uh, transactions. So for example, I am very sure that you are very used to like to these like decision trees, which you, use, which you use like for many things in which you say, okay, so if this value is uh, greater than X, you go right. If it's lower, you go left, right? It's a way to compress like information, right? This is like very similar, but instead of having rules, right? What we have is hashes, right? So what we do is that uh, we hash, in this case, for example, like uh, in, in the case of like a um, Bitcoin blockchain, we hash transactions. Alice gave one Bitcoin to Bob, right? 
And then this is this hash, right? It's a leaf, right, of the tree. And then kind of like in a Russian doll style, a Matryoshka style, like these hashes uh, are rehashed and rehashed and rehashed and rehashed, right? So at some point in time, you only have one hash out of the combination of all the leaves. And this hash is kind of like the fingerprint of not only the, the information containing the leaves, but also the position, right? And also the order, right? And also how you do this. So um, the interesting thing is that uh, now with these miracle trees, you can verify data without actually accessing the data per se. For instance, um, if I have a Merkle tree completely encrypted, I don't know what is inside. I don't know the raw information inside, but I have the hashes, which for me are completely, uh, um, uh, is completely um, hidden information like for me. And you come and you tell me, I have the same Merkle tree because I have the same root, the same like upper hash. And I think that this value with this value encrypted, you get the first leaf. I have to trust that you might have access to that information, right? Let me explain it to you like a better. So in this case, in this research, what we did is instead of like putting uh, transactions of, of the Bitcoin, right? What we did was encoding road actions. So what we did is me as an operator of the whole road swarm, I said, okay, so, Action one is stuck, or it could be a wonder, it could be look, it could be push, it could be whatever an action a robot could do. But in this case, let's imagine that we are trying to build a Lego, right? So action one might be a pull, and maybe the sensor input of action one could be piece number one. So this is leave one, right? So I encrypt the hash of the action pull, which is an action that a robot can do, and the sensor input, Lego piece number one, right? So I have the first leaf, push, Lego piece number one. For example, in the leaf number two, I can put um, stuck piece number two on top of piece number one, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So somehow with this plan, right, encoded in these leaves, I can encrypt it, I can give it to the robots and say, do this, coordinate yourselves like to do this, yeah, and find actions, find possible actions and possible sensor input that are within the Merkle tree. So for example, at some point in time, there's like one robot that goes around and says, okay, I found a Lego piece. Oh, fantastic. And what is this piece? Oh, it's piece number one. What, what can I do with piece number one? I can move it. So the hash of the action move with the hash of action uh, piece number one. Does this give me the hash encoded in leaf number one? No, okay, I'm going to try something else. Uh, move, uh, push, oh, stack, St the hash of the action stack with the hash of the action, Lego piece number one, give me the hash of the first action. So I know this is part of the plan without actually not knowing what the other actions are of the plan, right? So in a sense, you can start to do sequential actions without knowing or without inferring what the higher level like a uh, plan is, right? And the most interesting like, thing is that you can give proofs to the other robots. So now if you mm, completed, if robot number 15 completed 10 actions and I completed nine or eight, when we get together, we can say, hey, uh, how much of the plan do you have? Say, oh, I have 10 actions out of 16. Say, oh, I just have nine. You know, uh, you have more information than me, share it with me. But the interesting thing is that now you don't have to believe the robot because the robot can prove to you that with the information it has, right, the, the hashes somehow belong to the, to, the, to the tree. And somehow you don't need to trust the other robot because the robot can prove to you that it has the information that you think he's having, right? Anyway, with, with this information, robots now can communicate through transactions and can send proofs to each other. And then they can cooperate and complete like their, um, uh, their plan based on that. So here you have like a video like of this like research in this in this research like robots are trying like to build like a maze, right? So this maze is encrypted into, into this Merkle tree. You will see with task one, task two, task three, task four, right? And then there's an entrance and an exit, right? That robots do not know. 
So we put the robots, in this case 16 robots, right? Uh, and we gave them the Merkel tree. Hey, this is the root of the Merkel tree. Do whatever you have to do. They don't know, right? So the, at some point in time, you will see one robot going to uh, the first cell and saying, okay, I'm in cell number one. What should I do? I should move, I should stay. Oh, stay in cell number one or stop in cell number one is my first thing. I'm going to stay here, right? So now you see that the counter will increase and the red like arrow is how the other robots have to receive the proof that action one was complete. And the important thing is that that robot could be a bad bot or could be whatever, but will only have that information if actually he completed the action, right? Which is an interesting way that even, even crooks can work in their favor. If they say that they did what they are supposed to do, and they don't have any way to lie. So you will see that like actually the robots uh, build the maze without actually knowing what the entrance or exit might be. Which is very interesting. Yep. For the sake of, uh, of of time, you know, like I will leave you uh, with like some like uh, links, you know, like to the views if you, in case you are interested. But uh, I will finish like with this. So one of the last things that we did is that if you have like systems in which like robots can do things with security, and uh, and could become trustworthy, right? Because it's a trustless system, you have new uh, business models because now you can trust a machine that uh, only completed like a job in case it has the proof that it completed the job, right? So we created like a, a marketplace like for robots called Iridia Marketplace in which uh, now you can get your Merkle tree, right? You can upload it to the robots when the robots in the system, in the, in the lab, they are idle, right? Which are between experiments and the robots can do whatever uh, you plan in the Merkle tree without actually us or the robots knowing what they have to do. So there's no intellectual property like problems or anything like that, right? Check it out, it's blockchainfarm.eu. It's interesting, like we said, everything is explained there, right? And yeah, so I think that, so yeah, this is like a video like about how we develop like the infographic like system in which like we make the robots like uh, extract the information. So for us like to see, which is something interesting in this like a uh, robot and, and swarm like space, because sometimes we don't know uh, what information is going on, like as connectivity patterns, like sensor readings, etc. So it's also a very interesting, like a, a, a concept called tangible swarm to be able to find it online and yeah in order like to finish because maybe like i am i am already uh, running out of time uh, is the whole presentation somehow beyond like the specific like a uh, research like a uh, papers and, and all the stuff talks about the idea that the world of so the robots are here is not us against them it's us with them right and but but we cannot leave them completely unattended, right? Autonomy, for the sake of, of autonomy, is not good. We need to trust the autonomy. We need to increase the autonomy in order to make them do what we want them like to do. But we need transparency methods, accountability methods, explainability methods to really understand what they are doing. And this goes like for robots and goes for AI, right? Um, so. 15 years ago, we didn't have the technology to understand digital trust because the digital world was not uh, created in order to provide this. But now we have, we, or we are starting to have the means to trust digital assets, right? Uh, and understand that somehow proofs can be generated like to mm, rely on that piece of information without actually knowing where this information comes because it cannot be anything else. It could not be proved in any other way. And again, we need like to understand that this cannot only remain in, in lab environments, but like should be transferred like to society, right? Like so, if you have like to uh, get something like from this presentation, let 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 it be this. In the center of these like three bubbles, there's going to be significant progress in the next ten to to twenty years, right? And it would be fantastic like for me like to to have like spark you a little bit of curiosity like about what's going to happen in that center of that bubble okay yeah so with this i will finish thank you very much uh, uh, yeah if you have any questions please uh, let me know okay well thank you very very much eduardo for this very nice talk
So now it's time for questions. Do we have questions in the room? If that's the, the case, please do not hesitate to write your name in the, in the chat and I will manage the questions time. I don't know if there are any questions. Okay, Carlos, go ahead. Well, either in Spanish or in English, whatever you want, guys. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, so maybe better in English since the presentation has been in English. So first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. So my question is about uh, the experiment you showed about uh, detecting uh, Byzantine robots uh, with blockchain. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, really understand why blockchain improves the detection of those uh, harmful agents mm -hmm. instead of like that package communication. Is it because since each agent has a distributed copy of the blockchain, they can detect inconsistencies between, for example, like Robot A said, and maybe that uh, the majority color was white and now he's telling me that the majority color is black, so I can detect that? Or why is it like that? Thank you for the question, Carlos. Yes, uh, it's exactly the same. So the idea is that um, through making the robots transact with each other, there's like um, there's um, breadcrumbs like of their opinions. There's like a registry, you know, like of what, of what did they um, um, did they communicate like to the system, right? Like uh, uh, so at some point in time, or in this like times, row fifty nine said that the majority color was white. Right, and at some point in time, everybody will be able like to see this, right? So if so, if the robot basically starts like to uh, change its opinion, right, or it starts like to issue like a very weird behavior, counting the fact that everybody has the same controller, you are able like, to spot that incons inconsistency. You are able like to say, mm, we all have the same controller, and this robot is changing its opinion very frequently. What, what happens, right? I I met this robot in this area, and and I my majority color is white, but this robot is always saying that it's black. Why? So you have now a new layer, like to do like some some analytics, right? Which is uh, the registry of like the opinion of the robot, but also not only the registry, but also the idea that uh, the robot now can vouch for its opinion with its own assets. So if you say, okay, in the system, we are going to reach a consensus, but uh, we all every robot start with 10 Bitcoins, for example, right? And every time you give an opinion, you put one Bitcoin as an escrow, as a, as a, as a way to say, I am so sure about my opinion that I am willing like, to put this in a, in a third party like, place. And if you discover that I am saying bad information, you take it out from me, I lose it, right? So the blockchain not only uh, it creates the perfect plane to find inconsistencies, but also creates the tool for you to, or for robots, like to vouch for their opinion with their own assets. So when you uh, uh, lose uh, your assets because like you are misspreading information, you cannot talk. It's a way of reputation somehow. Did I, did I answer your question correctly? Yeah, uh, yeah, and about that, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. vouch system, to me that sounds really similar to proof of a stake like this mm -hmm. new system that is going to be implemented, for example, in Ethereum, like where instead of easy, uh, mining, like with your computer power, you like a uh, vouch, uh, you like put uh, your money. And if you're like, mm -hmm. for example, don't validate transaction correctly, you can lose that money. So is that inspired by that system or in some way similar? Yes, so it's, it's inspired like, a, like somehow, um, but it's not exactly the same. Um, so the idea uh, of like proof of stake, yes, is that at some point in time, like you have like a certain assets like within the system and then you put it like, and you say, okay, if uh, I don't validate the transactions, I, I will lose like some money, right? Uh, with this, somehow it's like a way of like a, it's, yeah, it's a way of reputation, right? It's a, I, all the information that you provide into the system, you know, uh, is useful like for us, either to get to the majority color, either to train a machine learning model, either like to do something, so we trust you because actually your information was useful. In the moment that your, inf your information is not useful, right? Because like you are getting into inconsistencies or whatever, we reduce your reputation. At some point in time, your reputation is so low that you cannot talk. So they are sim very similar systems like for different applications. But yeah, you, you can say that they are, they are very, very close like to each other. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. More questions? Any other question? Más preguntas? No? So, well, in any case, I would like to ask you something, Eduardo. It's related with um, the fact of achieving a trade off between a centralized control and a self organized swarm. I mean, what elements of centralized control, without losing the benefits of self organization, do you think are necessary? So I don't know how do you yeah how do you feel these two concepts interact yes well I so at some point there's a lot of research like about how to merge like both uh, things because actually if these two approaches have like different uh, benefits and different like uh, problems right like so for example centralized uh, control is very good to disseminate and broadcast information so in the moment that something happens like in the system um you you need some kind of like centralized like control. Let's imagine this. Let's imagine that you have like a swarm of robots. And let's imagine that you want to stop the swarm of robots because this, the robots are going to fall like a like a cliff or or they are going to do something or whatever. How do you stop that? Being this kind of like decentralized like control in which like every um, peer, you know, is, is in a peer-to-peer -peer like network. So it's very complicated. A centralized control is the only thing that basically will broadcast information reliably like so is so so well that we'll be able like, to stop this uh, this accident like from happening right but at the same time it's unsecure right like so it creates a, a lot of like a problems you know with uh, concentrating like the information like a, a um, halting the system you know like because like you are losing the the main input which is like centralized etc right so in a in a sense what we are trying like to do in this like project is um make the safety barriers so the swarm doesn't go rogue and 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 be able to understand the possibility that like a group of robots are able like to prove to you that nothing could go wrong or 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 that no problems are going like to like uh, they're going to arise you know like uh, and it's not because you trust in the system it's because the system gives you proof of that right so Somehow, I, I do believe that these two approaches, you know, need to be merged, you know, like somehow, right? But what we are, so we are trying like, to get there, like in this project, like through the idea of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized like systems that somehow prove to you that these situations are not going to happen, you know? Uh, the situation in which you might need centralized control might not happen. That's basically it. Okay, thanks a lot. So it seems we have another question. Ivan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thanks Edu for the presentation. Um, after I would like to ask you, like um, th these examples actually is kind of a toy game. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. uh, quite interesting one, but uh, have you think about uh, more complex examples? Like uh, when I saw the presentation, was like the Swarm could be established on other games or even online games where you can test those um, those interactions on swarms, even with different roles in in on each uh, uh, on each um, individual. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, the the actual question was about uh, where to test the next uh, the next data set or the next uh, experiment. That's a fantastic question, Juan. Uh, okay, so first of all. Yes, these are two examples, you know, like uh, in simulation and in the lab, you know, because mainly we don't have the ability like to right now take the robots out of like uh, of the lab is is there's huge problems, you know, like in the middle. But yeah, but it's true. Um, one uh, thing that basically I, we tried like already and it's very interesting is like this, like a marketplace like for for robots, right? Um, a swarm marketplace in which we make the swarm an art tool. Right, so the swarm basically is like a group of robots that paint with light. Um, you will you will be able to see it with these like projections. You know, like the robot turns into a into a into a pencil or it, it can draw. Right, so you can form artworks. You know, like with the swarm, right, in which you put some inputs, right, that nobody knows, and then the swarm will be able like to paint and will be able like to give you the picture, the video, whatever, which actually you pay. So there's like a real business system in which 
you pay for like the robots like to draw some artistic work like for you which is only yours and then you, you get it right and then you pay the robots for example my github logo if you search it you know is is done by the robots right like so my github um, icon right is done by the swarm which i i, I paid myself <laughs> uh, in order like to get like the artwork but there's been like two or three uh, like people already that have done uh, artistic works with the swarm and whatever and then they gave us like a crypto crypto money that we use in order like to make the robot sustainable you know like uh, recharge the batteries like uh, change the sensors etc very interesting work um this is a website called Kiridia swarm marketplace the other a uh, more kind of like a realistic like thing is we are trying to uh, put these algorithms into the city right especially this is like in in kendall area in boston and we are trying like to uh, use the bikes, like the uh, self-autonomous bikes that can that have a battery and can basically go autonomously to a recharge station. Um, and we are trying like to make uh, like this system like work in this environment in which like the bikes know where docking station is the appropriate one like to to go right uh, in order like to self-balance the system, right? So we we are trying to go towards there. Right, like uh, try like to find like a very simple uh, example, like uh, for a uh, urban mobility or or even like um, a urban robotic infrastructure, and try to use these these algorithms. Right, this is a little bit in a way I can tell you like, about that. Very interesting. Uh, thanks. Uh, I would say that I was thinking about. I mean, that's very interesting and a real world problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, also in, in scenarios like uh, video games, where a swarm of players play. Um, against other swarm of players, for example, yeah. uh, League of Legends or something like this. I don't know if it's uh, also the um, kind of interest of this. Uh... No, definitely, definitely, because I mean this. So especially the last research, like in science robotics, like this, like a uh, uh, Merkle tree, this cryptographic like data structure is super interesting because at the end allows you like to have the the codification, the blueprint of a plan that many agents will have like to coordinate and cooperate in order to do without actually knowing what the high level is. So normally, uh, if you complete like uh, tasks of the plan, you can get rewarded, right? But you don't know what the higher level is. Like, so in a situation in which you won't cooperate with someone else, right? Because you have like some, I don't know, a rivality or like whatever. Now, since you don't know who the other like uh, agents are like in the plan, you will be able to cooperate. Right. For example, another thing that we discover is that like this um, is also very good, like for encoding maps in the games. You know, like I, I totally see, you know, like your suggestion. But one of the things that we are doing research on is like about corruption, right? So we dis we uh, understand that corruption is the misalignment between local information and general information or global information, right? So when, for example, like a company knows that it's the only one company um, uh, applying for the for the public contract. It can raise the 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 money, you know, like of the of the of the service, right? Since you can give a plan, but you don't know who the others might be, or what what might be like the, the higher goal. You just know that you have to do a task of the big plan. You cannot lobby with other people, and we are seeing that this is very interesting like for mitigating corruption. But I'm totally sure that like there's a, a lot of like applicability in in video games. Yeah, I totally see. It. Thank you, Ivan. Me too. Okay, well, it seems we have another question from Carlos, so please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, this other question was about uh, Merkle trees and this like distributed plan. So I have two questions about that. The first one is uh, I, from what I've understood is that uh, you like uh, complete a task and you like obtain a hash that you can use to prove that you're completed the task. But why do you need to complete the task before uh, obtaining the hash? Like uh, what do you get from completing the task that allows you to obtain the hash. And the second one is how do you make sure that no task is completed twice? Like an agent, let's say, is embarking and wants to cooperate. How, how does the agent know that task, uh, like, let's say, 31 has, hasn't been completed yet? Very, very good questions. So let's go with the first one. Um, if I believe the first one is uh, 
what do you get from completing the task, right? Yeah, to um, prove it. So, mm -hmm. okay. So let's imagine in this example. Let's let's go back to this. Let's see. Uh, so, so the idea of this research is that if robot, mm, let's say robot uh, one, you know, gets into uh, place number one, right? Uh, the combination of uh, action, which is stop, uh, sensor input, which is cell number one, right, uh, will make the robot, you know, be at the center of the of that, right? Somehow, you know, in this case, like the swarm is like a, from the same from the same company or the same or the same operator, which is me, right? Uh, but you know, let's imagine that this uh, swarm is like from different companies. And these are different robots, you know, from different companies trying like, to do something, right? If you prove that you have the hash of the action stop and the hash of sensor input cell number one, right? And then we we understand that the hash of leaf one, which is the, the task number one, is composed of these two hashes that you found, right? I can pay you. I can reward you, right? Because in a sense, I can assume that because you discover the inputs of my first task hash, which is very hard to do by brute force, right? You completed the task and then I reward you. This is like my proof. This is your proof like to me that you are doing this. So I understand that in this, in this scenario, you can say, well, you know, the robot can go there, can find that the action stop and the action um, uh, cell one, you know, make these two hashes are the inputs of the first like task, and then the robot leaves, for example, right? And then goes somewhere else. Or I'd say but like even without moving, like maybe if the robot has ah, no how force. it calculates, I don't know. For example, the robot could say cell one and action one, obtains the hashes and compares cell one and action two. Like well, from what okay. I've understood, there, there, needs, there needs to be something in the real world or some information just or some information that you can only com uh, obtain after completing the task to calculate the hash, isn't it? Correct. It, it, correct. I, so yeah, and now I understand your question. Yes. So the, the idea is that robots, when they get the Merkle tree, they don't know nothing. So they, they, they don't know, maybe they know the set of uh, of actions, you know, that they can do, right? But they don't know what sensor input they are going like, to face. So they don't even know that cell one is cell one. The, I, know, I don't know if like I, I explain myself. So, uh, so in that situation, cell one could be GP, GPS coordinates, or could be um, a certain um, photography, you know, or could be like a certain things, right? So maybe you can brute force the number of actions you have, but you cannot brute force the the set of sensor inputs, because it, you even do not know what sensor you know will give you the hash. I, so doing it by brute force is is, is almost like impossible, but also. Yes, as you said, you can encrypt. So this sensor input could be something that the robot can only see or can only experience while the task is completed. Okay. Yeah, I think I understand. Like uh, until okay. you get to that cell, you get the GPS position and all the data coming from the sensors. Only then you can compute the hash, and that's something Correct. that you can't uh, properly simulate. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because the, the search space is so big with all the possible sensors, with all the possible mm, values of those sensors, that is impossible like, to do it like by brute force. So at some point in time, only the robot that goes to cell one and is able to say, okay, now uh, I have 10 sensors. Okay, let's let's go, let's go. start with the GPS. Oh, uh, GPS tells me that it's cell one. Okay, so if I stop in cell one, oh, I get the hash, I, I should do this. So, um, so this is one thing, right? And then, sorry, like, uh, Carlos, the other question was, like, I don't remember. Uh, so the other question was, like, for example, the robot uh, gets to cell one. How does, how do robots avoid repeating the same task? Uh, now I think okay. that I understand that, like, when you get to that cell, you try to see what task you could complete in that cell. And if they've been completed, because you can, you have the Merkle tree and you compare. Correct. So, so in this research, what happens is that when robot, like, completes, for example, like task number one, right? Uh, it can generate like a proof. It can generate like a, 
with the two hashes that it discovered, right, can say, A, whatever robot that comes into my communication range. Uh, these two hashes, if you combine them, you know, you have like a, the hash of task one that we all share. So, so I could not have forged them. So you should understand that task one has been completed by me because I have this information. I'm not going to reveal what is the raw information. I'm not going to reveal that is uh, stop in cell number one. But I have this hash, and I have this hash that together make task one. So I can prove to you that I already completed the task, and you should update your your index of tasks like in, in your Merkle tree. So don't look for task one anymore because task one has been completed. I gave you the proof. So the robots go and and try like to uh, find task number two. Also physically, in this research, when robots uh, complete the task, they get into the middle of the cell, right? And then they dock there. So if a robot doesn't receive, because there's a communication error or whatever, the proof of a robot that already has completed the task, the robot cannot go to the, to the center and cannot claim that the task has been completed because there's all, a, a robot basically blocking it. So, so it can never generate the, the proof of a task that is, is being completed already. Do, do you understand? Yeah, but instead of that, for example, for other tasks, could you use like a blockchain and you store, for example, the time of transaction? So if other robot recompletes the same task, you see like, no, this task has uh, previously been completed according to the blockchain, but these other robots. Yeah, so yeah. could you do that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think we have time for a very short last question. I don't know if there are more questions. A very short one. No? Okay, so well, we can thank the speaker. Thank you very much again, uh, Eduardo, for your very nice talk. And thank you to all the attendees and all the questions, very interesting. So we can finish here this online seminar. Um, uh, we'll meet again in February for the next uh, monthly seminar of NASTY. Okay? Well, thank you, Eduardo, again. Uh, it's been a pleasure, you know, like to be with you guys uh, again. So um, if you have any question, uh, if you um, have any suggestion or whatever, more than happy like to, to answer it like uh, by email. Uh, yeah, uh, good luck and yeah, let's stay in touch. Exactly. Thanks a lot.